Ian Fitzpatrick, District Superintendent of Canada Central District here, Ontario and Quebec. Give him a hand of welcome, would you? Amen, amen. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Pastor Nick, and thank you, whoever did that. I appreciate it. It is so good to be with you again tonight. This morning, uh, we had a, a time together, and I really do appreciate that. The celebration of the Lord's Supper is, is always a highlight for me personally. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of that. Um, God's providence is always right on time, right on time. It is good to see Paul and Anna, and uh, Paul serves on our advisory board in Canada, Quebec, and in just a few weeks we will be meeting at the district office, that is the district advisory councils of both districts. We'll be meeting with Dr. Porter and Dr. Broadbooks to do, begin conversation on merger. Uh, we're not sure how that's going to go or where it's going to go, but um, you're going to be making several trips here, Paul and Anna. It's so good to have you with us tonight. And uh, they attend, are members of the uh, Franklin Center Church, which is just about 45 minutes to an hour outside of Montreal. I've had a couple of funny experiences with these two, maybe more than a couple, but a couple I can tell you about. And... Uh, I, I rent a car most of the time when I'm in Montreal, but this one time Paul picked me up from the airport and we were on our way to the district office. And uh, as, we, as we turned a corner at reasonable speed, uh, I can tell you this, that his seat belts do work. His seat belts work well. His door doesn't work because it flew open. But his seat belts work well and, and I felt secure. I knew I wasn't going anywhere. I was locked in there. And the funny thing is, there was a police officer who was just sitting kitty corner to us eating a donut, and uh, he saw everything that was going on. And instead of coming after Paul for a faulty car, he just laughed. He just, he just laughed. Now, Anna's story is a little more serious, and uh, Anna has probably the distinct uh, privilege of being the only one in this room who has driven over a general superintendent's wife's foot twice, backward and forward. And uh, that woman, I don't mean Anna, but Mrs. Warwick now has a permanent limp and uh, is grateful to Anna for that. And so, uh, Keisha, when I heard you sing tonight, it's not over till God says it's over, that story actually came to mind. And I'm going to claim perfect healing for Mrs. Warwick tonight. But uh, there's a lot more to Anna and Paul than just these crazy stories. I deeply appreciate both of you. And I know I speak uh, on behalf of Pat as well. Would you just welcome them again to our service? God bless you both. God bless you both. Now, does anybody know what pillar we were talking about this morning? Just as a matter of curiosity, the pillar of holiness. And we uh, are going to use our verse again from Proverbs chapter 9, that very long passage, but just the first verse is our theme verse for the week. Because tonight I want to talk about the pillar of obedience as a result of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. So this morning we talked about the pillar of holiness. Tonight the pillar of obedience as a result of of the work of the Holy Ghost. Here is the word of the Lord. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out its seven pillars. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out its seven pillars. This morning we discovered that the reason the word her is used here is because it is the feminine uh, word in the part of speech in Hebrew that describes this. Therefore, uh, being a feminine uh, part of speech, we're going to refer to her as her. We talked about pillars that are visible and pillars that are not so visible in this very building in which 
we are enjoying this service tonight. And our call as a result of the infilling of the Holy Spirit is indeed to be a pillar, to hold up the infrastructure of the church, to hold up the infrastructure of our communities, to hold up the infrastructure of our homes, to hold up the infrastructure of society and even a nation. It will not happen only with the legislative pen of a politician, but with the power of the Holy Spirit working in the hearts and lives of God's people. All the way through history, while there have been silent moments in the life of the church, and, and all we need to do is go back to the Second World War. All we need to do is look at places in the history of our world where the Christian church remained, for the most part, silent, except for a few occasions where she really spoke out. And even then, it was usually an individual voice against wrong and not a collective voice against wrong. So tonight and throughout this week, I pray that the journey towards revival and the journey towards deepening our relationship with Jesus and our walk with Him will take us down a path of discovery and to the place where we will be able to leave here on Friday, not hearing for the first time that we are called to be pillars, but perhaps hearing in a new way. Now, using Proverbs 9 and 1 as the basis uh, for the message this evening, I, I would want to have you turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, and uh, we're going to begin reading at verse 9. Now, this is a rather long portion of Scripture, but it is Scripture. Therefore, it deserves full attention and it deserves our full appreciation for it. I would normally ask you to stand, but it is a rather long uh, portion of Scripture, so um, uh, there will be a point at which I will ask, ask you to stand. But I'm going to read from Acts 10. Remain seated for the first section of this. Acts 10, verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on a roof to pray. He became hungry and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, replied Peter. I have never eaten anything unclean or impure. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now this happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. And while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the man sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who we or was known as Peter, and we know as Peter, was staying there, while Peter was still contemplating, still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I, I have sent them. So Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one that you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. 
Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Please stand. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Talking with them, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. Can I ask you why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, four days ago, I was in my house praying at just about this hour, three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is also called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately. And it was good of you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. And then Peter began to speak. I realize now how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This morning, as we talked about the pillar of holiness, we referenced Peter, we referenced really all of the disciples as they were waiting, watching, discouraged, disappointed, Jesus had not lived up to their expectation. Jesus was crucified. Jesus had told them often that he would rise again on the third day. And instead of the anticipation of the third day resurrection, they were, not only Thomas, by the way, but they were in a state of disbelief, if not unbelief. And there's a difference in those two words. Unbelief is a spiritual condition. Disbelief is a natural reaction. Disbelief is, I, I can't believe it. I, I can't believe that he has risen again from the dead. Or, I can't believe you're here in front of me. Which was both of the experiences of the disciples on that particular day when Jesus appeared before them and said, Look at my hands, look at my feet. I'm not a ghost. A ghost does not have flesh and blood as you see that I do. Touch me and see. And so in the midst of all of that, he then gives them the instructions. After opening their minds to understand the scriptures, he then says to them, I want you to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Peter was amongst those who would now be the face of the church. He would now be the face of what a Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit-filled individual would look like. There's a lot of debate in the church of the Nazarene these days as to the doctrine of entire sanctification. What it is, how we theologize the scriptures and we begin to bring about a formulated statement which becomes article number 10 of the church. But I think the bigger question is not so much what do we believe about the Holy Ghost as it is in these days, show me a person who's filled with it or with him. Not so much what should I be anticipating when it happens, but Give me a case study. Give me an exhibit A. 
show me somebody in some of our churches somewhere who is anointed and filled with the Holy Ghost and is a pillar. I don't want that question to be offensive because I include myself in that question. I want that question to be searching because Peter, you see, was one of those who would have tarried. He would have been one of those who perhaps felt that he was excluded, but Jesus went to great lengths in the scripture when he instructed the disciples to meet him on the beach by the Sea of Galilee and tell Peter. And so when he became clothed with the Holy Ghost, he then was able on that day of Pentecost, as I said this morning, to preach a message where 3,000 people came to know Jesus. They gave their hearts to Jesus. They were not just considering Jesus as a religious option, because there were many religious options, as there is today. He did not just consider Jesus. He, they actually accepted Jesus. True transformation by conversion. An amazing, an amazing record of victory. However, eight years later, we come to this particular story now, some eight years later, this particular story where the same Peter who preached on the day of Pentecost, filled and anointed and overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit, is struggling with some biases. He's struggling with some ideas that the Gentiles could actually, actually receive the Holy Ghost. How, how could that be? Is it then possible, as we extrapolate, is it then possible that any one of us could have a momentary experience with the Holy Ghost? We could, in fact, come to an altar or be there in the pew or wherever it is, where the Holy Spirit comes and invades us and we surrender our righteousness and we become entirely sanctified for eight years later for us to be dealing with some biases and some prejudices in our own lives. They don't have to be racial prejudice. In fact, this one was. But they could be social prejudices. They could be denominational prejudices. They could be anything. The answer to that question has to be yes yeah, because it's biblical. We have a record, we have an exhibit A, we have a case study. If Peter were here today, we would bring him up onto the platform and we would say, Peter, tell us about your experience. And he would say, I can sit down, just read about it in Acts. The <laughs> fact of the matter is, we read this story of the New Testament church throughout the Acts of the Apostles, and somehow we get this folklorish idea that everything was wonderful, that there were no problems in that early church, that it was growing hand over fist, that the Lord was adding to the church daily those who were being saved. That is exactly true in Acts 2, 42 to 47. But by the time you get to Acts chapter 10, there were issues. There were problems. And if we look at an eight-year anniversary compared to a 35-year anniversary, that's four times the distance out, my guess is that individuals around the church, and if we look at a 100-year anniversary for a denomination, my guess is that if we look 10 or 11 or 12 times out from this, we are dealing with some of the same problems. And it is holding back some of the revival that we long for, some of the anointing that we desire to have, so, some of the blessing that we really are calling on God to provide. And so as we look at this chapter, we begin to think uh, about the Hollywoodization of Acts, and we say to ourselves, no, no, let's come to terms with some of the issues, let's come to terms with some of the problems, and let us deal with them. And what was the problem? The problem was that for Peter, in Acts chapter 2, God had fulfilled his will because he had poured his spirit out upon the Jews. That's it. Case closed. No more. We've got it. Our heritage is now fulfilled because the Messiah has come. We believe that. That is those 
who were transformed. I'm not talking about Jews today who are not yet transformed. But those disciples who were primarily Jews had received the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2 closed the book on God's potential until you get to Acts chapter 8. And in Acts chapter 8, God has the audacity to now give that same Holy Spirit to the Samaritans. To the Samaritans. The Samaritans. How could he do that? Samaritans are not us. You, you mean they have the same privilege? You mean that woman who was saved at the well back in John's gospel when we were walking with Jesus while he was still on this earth? You mean the people that she represents, they can have the same power that we can have? How, how dare they? How dare they? So Acts chapter 2, we have the Jews filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 8, we have a Samaritan Pentecost. And now, lo and behold, in Acts chapter 10, God was going to use Peter. Peter, a pillar. A pillar. Wisdom has built her house. That is the wisdom of God. The fear of God being the beginning of that wisdom. The understanding of God being the beginning of that wisdom. The recognition of God as sovereign. I trust tonight that every person in this sanctuary believes in the sovereignty of God. I trust that tonight, even though we're not of the Reformed tradition, that the sovereignty of God plays the primary part in your life and in my life. For if we take away the sovereignty of God, we are declaring Godship ourselves. And I can't handle that. And you can't handle that. But the sovereignty of God, now working with the free will of the Apostle Peter, having to do some work on Peter before that free will becomes aligned with the sovereignty, now is going to bring about a miracle. But I've given away the story. I've, spoiler alert. Wonderful example of the coming together of God's will and man's obedience. God's will and man's obedience. It's amazing to me here how we, reading through the scripture, would discover that sometimes we do need to take a look back. Sometimes we need to recognize when the last time God's sovereignty was made manifest in your church service. When God's sovereignty just came in, the word describing the immediate intervention of God here is suddenly. As Peter was preaching, and now I'm getting a little ahead of the narrative, but as Peter was preaching, suddenly the Holy Ghost came in upon the congregation. He didn't get to finish his message. And I'm sure that Pastor Nick or any of the members of the staff here wouldn't mind one bit that if in the middle of their sermon, people started coming to an altar. I'm sure you wouldn't mind that in the middle, if you didn't get to finish your points, if you didn't get to finish your good story, if you didn't get to give that great illustration that would seal the deal, suddenly the Holy Ghost just came in upon the church. I long for that. My desire is that that would happen. Whatever church we happen to be worshiping in on a Sunday morning, whatever district assembly we happen to be at, whatever general assembly is planned, whatever M15 or PALCON comes, let the Holy Ghost just come in suddenly. How can you be prepared for suddenly? How can the church be prepared for suddenly? I'm not sure that we actually can. In fact, that might be a bit of an oxymoron, preparing for suddenly. But it's not an oxymoron because the Bible gives us classic examples where that happened over and over again. Suddenly, Jesus appeared in their midst. Suddenly, there was a heavenly host over the field in Bethlehem. Suddenly, 
the Holy Ghost fell. There is something about our preparation for the suddenly that actually brings about revival. Oswald Chambers, in one of his commentaries in the Daily Devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, he said that ready people never need to get ready. That, that's beautiful. Now, I have to read Oswald Chambers two or three times to understand what he's actually saying. But when I get it, I get it. Ready people never need to get ready. Sort of the bags are already packed. Kind of live with a suitcase at the door or at the bottom of the bed or something. That's just life these days. And you just need to be ready. Are we ready for revival this week? Are we ready to be a pillar of holiness? Are, are we then ready to be a pillar of obedience which comes out of the experience of holiness whether it's eight minutes or eight years or 80 years after the initial experience, the test of God to Peter was, what do you think of those Samaritans? Basically, that's it. That's the bottom line. What do you think of those Gentiles? Before this event, if Peter had been in this church, he wouldn't like one of us. He wouldn't like any one of us. He would have a big problem with us, and he would call us imposters. He would tell us that we're really not we're really not of the, uh, of the same line he is, which was absolutely true. But Jesus was confirming here that in him there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. That we are what? All one in Christ Jesus. Now that's okay for him to say it. It's quite another thing for us to believe it. Let me just talk straight to you. Came out of meetings this week, as I told you, in Milwaukee. One of the discussions in those meetings was the role of women in ministry in the Church of the Nazarene. Did you know that this district has the highest proportion of women in ministry? Do you know the struggle that's going on south of this border with the U.S. to have that happen? You can have a declaration, you see, a denominational declaration that we believe in women in ministry, and then you go to a church board with a woman candidate and see what happens there. It's a whole different world. There's a big difference between declaration and practice. So we might say we believe in the spirit-filled life. We believe in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We believe in entire sanctification. That's a declaration. But what about the practice? And this is where Peter was going to change his mind and his lifestyle and his ministry and his perhaps even eternal destiny where he would come head-on colliding with his declaration and his practice. I think that's where we all are, by the way. No matter what stage of life we are at, there will always be a titanic clash between the declaration of our mouths and the intent and the desire and the practice of our hearts. It is the difference between Jewish belief system and Greek belief system. Jewish belief system had creeds, and those creeds were not only stated, but they were adhered to. Greek tradition had belief systems that were aspired to. Big difference. Which is it for us? Is it a belief system that becomes a work in progress? Is it a belief system that has every word followed to the nth degree? Or is it a belief system that we aspire to? That will be the difference between revival coming upon its church, his church, or not. It is more than an aspiration to. It is a present experience that we can all enjoy. And for Peter to get there, he needed his eyes opened. And boy, did he get his eyes opened. So what's the application for us tonight as we seek to become pillars? Pillars in the church. Pillars holding up the community. Pillars holding up the nation. Pillars holding up the family. Firstly, let me tell you, 
that we need a strong sense of obedience. This is a pillar of obedience we're talking about. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. When was the last time you fell at Pastor Nick's feet in reverence? Now, you're getting a word picture here. I know you are. But I'm asking the question only to make the point, and it's this. When God is in the midst of his church and in the midst of his leader, those two come together with a mutual admiration, which is more than just liking you. It is a respect for the role it is a respect that God is working. It is a respect that on a roof, just hours earlier, God had spoken to a man by the name of Peter, and he had spoken to Cornelius, and they were bringing these two together. And Peter said, in an act of equal obedience, get up. Cornelius' obedience was to fall down and revere him. Peter's obedience was, look, I'm only a man, get up. That's amazing. Two acts of obedience that would bring them to a level playing field. What would have happened if Peter had said, oh, yeah, and so you should. Oh, yeah, just stay there a few more minutes for all the years that you gave us hardship. Just lie there until I'm ready to tell you to get up. What would have happened then? We wouldn't have had the miracle. But he didn't. The act of obedience on the part of Cornelius was equaled to the act of obedience on the part of Peter. And in the life of the church, when we're seeking revival, in these days of whatever we want to call it, but perhaps dysfunctionality with regard to respect for leaders and respect for politicians and respect for clergy people, I'm going to tell you that we still need to have that mutual agreement between those who spiritually lead us and those who follow. And if we lose that in the church... We are in danger of losing everything. That doesn't mean there's an automatic conclusion that the pastor's always right. That doesn't mean that there's an automatic assumption uh, that he or she in spiritual leadership makes no mistakes. It's nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is God's voice speaking to two people in two different worlds, in two different religious worlds. One a Jew, one a Gentile, one who was actually part of occupying forces. And they came together in a beautiful way through an act of obedience. That is, in my book, a pillar. In spite of Peter's background of racial superiority, in spite of Peter's background of spiritual superiority, this act of obedience paved the way for the suddenly coming into the life of the church. Obedience is the fundamental issue between God and man. It always has been, and it always will be. Whether it's Adam and Eve in the garden, or should I say disobedience, whether it is Adam and Eve in the garden, or whether it is adherence to the Ten Commandments, or whether it's listening to Jesus when he says this, you will be my disciples if you do what I ask. I think sometimes in the church we, we get a little bit confused with regard to the unconditional nature of God. The unconditional love of God is what we hear so often, and I, I believe that. I'm a recipient of the unconditional love of God, and so are you if you're saved. But once we're saved... It's, now longer, it's no longer unconditional, it's conditional. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's the condition. You will be called my disciples if you do what I tell you. That's the condition. And so, clear that up in your mind right away. The unconditional love, uh, love of God doesn't stop when we become a, his child. 
but it takes on a whole new dispatch. It takes on a whole new flavor that my unconditional love, says God, reaches you in the darkness. It reaches you in the lostness. It reaches you in a state of unregeneration. But when regeneration happens, suddenly now the unconditional love becomes conditional. But the funny thing is, we're all right with that. We would never be all right with that before the first experience, but we're all right with it now because we understand it. That wisdom, that pillar of wisdom that comes from God now enables us to understand what he is talking about, and it is all about obedience. When Mary, the mother of Jesus, said to the disciples, look, this water is going to be turned into wine. I don't know how it's going to happen, but whatever he says, just do it. What wisdom there is in that? You talk about a pillar of obedience. While that might have been the disciples who actually became the water carriers and so on and so forth, the pillar of obedience in that story to me is Mary. Just, just do it. And sometimes we hear that through the voice of a Sunday school teacher. Or sometimes we hear that through the voice of a pastor or a leader who said, look, don't fully understand it. Don't have all the details. But whatever God's saying to you, just do it. Just do it. Let the details take care of themselves afterwards. Just do it. It might seem reckless, but you tell me a time when the history of the church did not appear reckless. She has always appeared reckless, even to some of us inside of it. But in that moment of recklessness, God brings his miracle. He brings his miracle. Praying in Gethsemane. Obedience, disobedience. What? Could you not just pray with me just for a little bit? Palm Sunday, go and you'll find a cult. Go to that address. You'll see that person. You'll see that animal. Do this. Do that. Prepare a place. Total obedience. Seems ridiculous. Total obedience. And of course, the Old Testament reminds us that obedience is better than sacrifice any day. It's always better than sacrifice. Someone has said, if one seeks, he will know. If one knows, he will love. And if one loves, he will obey. When Pat and I got married, we stood in front of a minister, probably three or four ministers, and we were admonished by at least one of them when placing the rings on each other's finger to say these words, this ring I give you as a token of my love and as a promise or a pledge of my constant fidelity. That's obedience, Pat. I know I haven't always been 100% on it, but I've sought to be. No, I take that back. You haven't always been 100% on it, but you've sought to be. I knew I got that wrong. <laughs> Why is it? Why is it that divorce rates are skyrocketing and through the roof? And I know this is old school conversation. Why is it? It's because when the romanticism of our relationship burns out, we just change partners, forgetting that that day we stood there and we said, even when the romanticism burns out, and it hasn't, but even if it did, just need to be clear, I made a promise to you that day. I made a commitment to you that day. I said to you what I meant that day, and you all have done the same. And that's what obedience is about. It's obedience to a commitment that I made before my Lord. And whether it's a wedding ceremony whether it's the baptism of, a, of an adult, whether it is the dedication of a child, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it is the renewal of our membership vows, whether it is aligning ourselves with the church today instead of 60 years ago, uh, up-to-date relationship, it is recognizing that I stand before you and God and I make a promise. That's what the covenant of Christian conduct and the covenant of Christian character is all about in the manual. You know, sometimes this manual can bore people to death. 
But I would urge every one of you in this room here tonight to go home and read the sections, Covenant of Christian Conduct and Covenant of Christian Character. And if you're not shedding at least one tear by the end of the passages, there's something wrong. Because those passages remind us of what we have promised when we become a child of God and a member of Christ's church. And Peter here was being reminded of this. Peter, this experience is not just for you. Peter, I want you to see this vision coming down. I'm not spending a lot of time on, on the vision and the animals and the reptiles and all the rest of that, save to say that God was already working on Peter's life. The very fact that he was in the home of Simon the Tanner, whether he realized it or not, he had already crossed the line. We need a strong sense of obedience. If we're going to be a pillar in the church, the pillar of holiness gives way to an experiential reality. That is, we need a strong sense of obedience and we need a strong sense of expectancy. Let me ask you a question. I've asked this several places I go, so you may have heard it before, but do you think the best thing that God has ordained for you in life has already happened? Do you think the best thing that God has planned for you in life has already happened? If it has, well, I really don't. If, if it has, actually, the sermon's over. Because I, I have nowhere else to go. If it has, you're going to be miserable. <clears throat> if it has, you won't be waking up tomorrow morning going, wow, what's he going to do today? Who's he going to send my way today? Because I believe that... <clears throat> The best days are always ahead of us because with the hymn writer who based this little song on scripture that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Now that's not just a nice little ditty. That's not just a, a nice little song that we would have. Do you know what that is? That is <clears throat> that every day I am growing in Christ. And I'm growing in him from glory to glory. He's changing me. Changing me. Changing me. His likeness and image to perfect in me. The love of God shown to the world until I grow up into him who is the head over all things. If I lose my sense of expectancy when I come to church, I become nothing more than a museum piece. I want you to get the picture here. Peter has come from Joppa. He's on his way to Cornelius' house. They meet just outside the door. Cornelius, at the other end of the spectrum, has invited his friends. They're inside the house. They're inside the church. And there's going to be a meeting now of philosophies, there's going to be a meeting of religiosity, there's going to be something either great or awful. Outside the door, it's possible to go south. This thing could really bomb. <clears throat> Inside the door, things changed. Where are you? Inside or outside the door? Because a lot of people in life today and in the church today live outside the door with the anticipation that it's all going to bomb. What? You mean, what if they don't show up, Pastor Nick? You mean we're going to put all this energy into it? What happens if, 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 if it just doesn't come off? What happens if it's a failure? What happens if we go financially into the hole because of that? Listen, that's outside the door thinking. That's standing in front of your Cornelius and saying, ah, you know what, maybe I'll just go back to Joppa. But when they crossed the door, the threshold, they saw people who had come with a sense of expectancy. To a person with a strong sense of expectancy, all doors have handles and hinges. To a person with foreboding doubt, all doors have locks and latches. 
person with a strong sense of expectancy. All doors have handles and hinges. When Jesus said to the disciples, I must go through Samaria, they had latches and they just shut up the doors. But Jesus, he had a hinge to the Samaritan world, which may well have given way to the Pentecostal experience that they had when that woman went back to her village and told people everything, everything that Jesus had said about her. Amazing. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? I love this definition of a pessimist. Here's what it is. A pessimist is a person who feels bad when he feels good for fear that he'll feel worse when he feels better. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> Write that down. A pessimist is a person who feels bad when he feels good for fear that he'll feel worse when he feels better. In the church, we are all risk takers, every one of us, but it's a calculated risk because the person who holds the odds is the creator of the world. When you come to church, when you come to Bible class, when you come to youth program, when you come to Sunday school, I'm asking every Nazarene and every adherent in this room Please come with a sense of expectancy that God is going to do something wonderful in that class, wonderful in that service, wonderful in that practice for Christmas choir, wonderful wherever it is. Come with a sense of expectancy when you get the praise team together. This is going to sound like the hallelujah chorus. Because if we don't come with a sense of expectancy, then we have actually made up our minds not to be blessed. We have made up our minds. We're not going to be blessed. Say what you want, pastor. Well, I'm not going to be blessed. But coming with a sense of expectancy where that door... Peter, Peter, come with a sense of expectancy. It's not only the people, but it's you too. What's going to happen? Well, his expectancy was nothing more than pure obedience because he didn't understand what was going to happen next. But he decided to be a vessel. So even when you don't understand it, just come. Come with a mind that is wide open to the things that God might do in your life, and you will be blessed. Oh, we need, if we're going to be pillars, we need to have a strong sense of obedience. We need to have a strong sense of expectancy. And we need to have a strong sense of openness. After thanking God, Peter for coming to his home. Here's what Cornelius said. Now we're all here. Now we're all here. Well, you can look around and see we're all here. We're present. 6.30, we were here. We know that to be the case. But he said something else. We're all here in the presence of God. Dr. Bob Broadbooks was our speaker at the clergy spouse retreat last weekend. Just a marvelous speaker. He said some wonderful things, and, and I want to share with you one of the things that got my attention. He was talking about the difference between being absent yet present. That is, here we are tonight, and we know that the Lord is present, but you can't see him anywhere, right? He, there's, there's absent yet present. And he talked about that for, for a little while. And I didn't know where he was going, but then he went on to the next pair of words. And then he talked about being present but absent. The first referred to our Lord. The second referred to us. How many times have you been physically present in church, but you've been absent? How many times have we been physically present? Maybe even up here on the pulpit, Pastor Nick. I'm not suggesting that's your style. But you, you can have a bad day like everybody else. And you can go through the routine like everybody else. I wouldn't be surprised that in 35 years you had one or two of those days. But at least you were here. I'm tired of hearing those words. At least I'm here. Don't tell me that. I would rather you not be here 
if you're not present. At least I'm here. No, that's no way for a mature Christian who's seeking revival, who's seeking renewal to come before the Lord. It's not, at least I'm here. At least I pay my tithes. At, at least, you know, my membership's up to date. I'm in good standing. No, that's not the point. The point is that you can be here but absent. Our minds can be a million miles away. Our hearts can be somewhere else. Our thinking and our planning can be somewhere else. If we are going to seek and to find the revival that's going to come suddenly, then we need to be present. Mind, body, soul, and spirit, present. Because that's what makes us pillars. We are all here in the presence of the Lord. To listen to everything the Lord has commanded you. What a weight of responsibility, pastors. We are all here in the presence of the Lord to listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you. Peter, it's all yours. Take it, take it from here. Eight years ago, Peter would not have said what he said. But eight years later, he launches into a sermon. And since he's speaking to a bunch of Gentiles, he launches into a sermon without uh, thinking that they would have no knowledge of the Old Testament, because only Jews would have that. But as he begins to paint the picture and as he begins to lift up the great story of Jesus and his love. I want you to listen to what he says. Beginning at verse 34, then he began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Now, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel. What? You, you know that. Telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good, healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything that he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. You know, they killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And Peter said, can anybody keep these people from being baptized with water? They've just received the Holy Spirit the same way we did. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to stay with them for a few days. It's a great story. But it's more than a story. He was speaking Jesus to the Gentiles. A Jew speaking Jesus to the Gentiles. And in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit. Spirit came. This was as much a message to Peter as Peter's message to them. And as children of God who are called to be his followers, called to be his disciples, always remember that everything God puts us into, it is as much a message for us as it is for the people we are talking to. Our witness in the community is as much a message to us as it is to them. 
We might think it's old hat. We might think we've said this and done this a million times. But if somebody's hearing it for the first time, you are giving water to a dry and thirsty land. You're being a pillar in the church. Wisdom, the fear of God, the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out its seven pillars. The pillar of holiness, the pillar of obedience that comes through the baptism with the Holy Ghost. If somebody testifies that they are saved and sanctified and going on with the Lord, I would have to say, by our fruits, we will be known. Peter's fruit of obedience proved that on the day of Pentecost, even though it took eight years, he was changed. He was changed. Where are you tonight? Are you outside Cornelius' house? Or are you inside? Are you sitting on the edge of your seat every time you have an opportunity to come to church? Are you anticipating what's going to happen in Sunday school and Sunday morning and Bible study and midweek learning experiences? Are you ready? Are you ready? If you are, God will come in his fullness. Please stand with me for a moment. Worship team, would you come? Hannah, however the Lord has led you tonight, I want you just to, to lead us. God speaking to you on the rooftop as you see the vision coming down. And God speaking to us. Folks, this is the second service of our revival series. This week is going to fly by. It really is. You're here by divine purpose tonight. I strongly believe that. And I would ask that tonight, if there's something in your heart, if there's some uh, Jew-Gentile thing, I doubt it very much, but if there's some other kind of issue in your heart that's causing you to not be a faithful minister to the whosoever, the whosoever, would you settle it tonight? You may not have a vision on the roof of Simon the Tanner's home, but I've told you about it. You can get a picture of it. You may not have to walk all the way to Cornelius' house, but you can be still outside it. Open the door. You may have a neighbor that you need to go and talk to that you've held resentment towards. You may have a family member, just like Jonah when he was crying over Nineveh being saved. He had every right to have his problems with Nineveh, yes, but, but sitting under that plant that God had provided for him. And then as God provided it, God took it away and Jonah began to pout. And here's what God said. You're more concerned over a vine that I could create in one second and destroy the next than you are over 120,000 people in Nineveh. You might have your reasons not to like them. They may have taken your ancestors and stripped the skin off them and used it as wallpaper. But that's not the point. The point is that right now, I'm calling you, Jonah. And if you don't do it, they're going to be saved anyway. So just get over it. The story of Jonah doesn't end with a happy ever after story. It doesn't say, well, they all lived happily ever after and Jonah was fine. No, it just ends with that. If you read it, it just ends like that. So tonight, outside Cornelius' door or inside it? Which is it? Let's sing together.